Hey, welcome everyone to Cube Conversations. This is John Furrier, the founder of SiliconANGLE. We are here live in, in Palo Alto. We're here with Tyler Bell, Vice President of Product with Factual. For Cube Conversations around big data and business, Tyler, welcome to the Cube Conversation. Thank you, John. So big data, obviously, we've been covering for a long time, and uh, data's the hottest thing right now. People say data's the next oil, data lakes, data oceans, as I say, but data is obviously central to the value proposition of this next generation of social, mobile, cloud, and certainly cloud has, has, has propelled data as a, as a first class citizen in the, in the developer framework, into business models. Um, so I want to just get your take on um, uh, what you think about the big data space in terms of, uh, for the folks out there who are looking at using data to re re recast their business models, look at application development, and figure out how to use data uh, to enable their business for this next generation. Yes. Yeah, one reason you see and hear of all these metaphors around data is because people are trying to, to grab various sort of ideas in their head and better understand how to, how to articulate this new value, which is something we haven't really seen before. Uh, and really what it is, is that you see the separation of data from, from the program. And really that's where things come into its own. It's really only relatively recently that the idea of data as an asset has come to fruition. And with that mental separation, we now have the tools that just work with the data independent of the business process. And so uh, as data has, has grown in quantity, yes, but I think it's also the mental shift is that people, executives, technicians are understanding that data as an asset means that I can build a moat or I can, I can uh, broaden my wall against the competition and actually do things in the sector that haven't been seen before. I'd like to get your take on how data has changed, how the mindset around data has changed in terms of how people acquire data, what to acquire, what to look for, databases, and a lot of those technologies and around how the tooling's changed into this new generation. But first, tell the folks out there about Factual. Uh, what are you guys doing? What's your business? What's your business model? And, and what is the vision of Factual? Yeah, well, Factual's a, uh, a data platform, obviously. That's why I'm here. We focus specifically on location data. So, uh, and that can take many different forms. And I think every, each form is particularly important. The first one is uh, location data in the terms of commercial places. So all the bricks and mortar stores around the globe. So we have our, our foundational product layer is about uh, 70 million places in 50 countries. And we use that, that's valuable because it's of course valuable in any kind of mapping or social discovery app or check-ins, any kind of review app, requires that seed data around which they can wrap their own content, much like uh, a pearl is formed around a small, small grain. Uh, and then of course, on top of that, we have the idea of uh, working with location data. So where users go over time, where people re return to, what's important to them, what can we learn about people based upon, and, and, and behavioral patterns based upon where they go. And so that's taking, say, your location data from your app, overlaid it on top of our places with some machine learning, and then we return uh, information about your user base and that, that, that new enriched data can be used by you to personalize how your app behaves uh, and also make sure that you're producing more relevant content. I had a chance to speak with Gil, your, your CEO, and he talked about you guys have been around for multiple years doing a lot of hardcore development and, and knowing the company, you guys are a lot of data geeks and you guys are, you guys are digging into the data. Um, who are some of your customers today using uh, Factual and, and why are they using Factual? Mm. Uh, well, uh, we're very keen to announce two uh, new partners, or I guess you could say refreshed partners, that are, that are coming to Factual uh, to take um, a bigger bite out of our data. It used to be that when you launched, um, say, a mapping product or a local product or any kind of application, you start out in one country and you learn about that, and then you grow out country by country. Increasingly, organizations are saying, look, when I launch this mobile app, I want to go global from ground one. Uh, I want to know the entire geographic landscape in front of me. So companies come to Factual for our global places data, the international data, as well as the suite of tools we have around it. Uh, and the two that we're, we're announcing now are uh, Bing and, uh, and Yelp are coming on board uh, and they're, they're taking a big bite out of our international data, which is lovely to see. They're good partners. So you guys essentially acquire data from uh, the internet public data and you also have source data. Is that just like locations? Uh, their addresses, what are some of the data types and sources do you yeah. guys acquire? So, so this uh, specifically is, is relates to our places data. So that's that foundational product that I spoke of earlier. 
And uh, Factual excels in areas, not where there's too little data, but actually there's far too much. And, and really that's the internet pretty much, the entirety of the internet. So far too much data, it's heterogeneous, it's mixed up, it's erroneous, fragmentary, and it's dated as well. This stuff moves very, very quickly. In fact, we just released a blog post talking about our, our tens of millions of updates and deletions and refreshes and new places that we've added just in the last quarter. Um, so uh, everything's moving and what Factual wants to do is, is, and what we've done is build a crucible and basically you take all this poor data, this bad data, you take some very high quality trusted data that we get from partners, hotel chains will give us data, partners who work with hotel chains and restaurant chains give us data. We put it in this big melting pot, we, we ignite the switch and all the impurities are, are burnt off and we're left with this, this cool glowing nugget of pure canonical data. You know, I love, the, I love open source. Open source has been a great boom uh, for us uh, in, in the industry. You're seeing all the, that reflected now with cloud and other things, especially in software side. So data, in, in a way, has to be open. So um, you know, one observation we always hear is, I have some data, but if I just can put it into a pool, if you will, and make it better, can I get other data? So everyone has data, right? That's, that's, that's clear. Um, but then folks want to know what to do with the data. So like, how to make sense of the data. So um, can you just explain that concept of um, I call it silo data, what do you want to call it? But yeah. you know, if I'm a hotel chain, I got all kinds of customer data, I got product information about my hotel, but I'm just a hotel, I'm not a restaurant. So this is the challenge, right, is in that internet companies have faced. How do you, yeah. you one, make all that data work together? Yes. And there's yeah. a lot of like, there's a lot of nuance. There's also a lot of like uh, hard stuff under the covers, like cleaning the data. Just explain that, vet that whole concept out. This notion okay. of of openness and having data sets that from different sources come together. Yeah. Uh, so, so with that one question you've hit upon about five <laughs> vital aspects. <laughs> I do that all the time. Of, of, of data. So I'll, I'll I'll break them up and uh, address them as I as I can. The first with the idea of openness. Um, uh, we sort of the 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 tech sector or individuals don't have a very good mental model of how to share data yet. That's something that doesn't exist. Because uh, the general uh, thought process, the belief system, you know, from, from your company's lawyers down to you know, the executives and product managers, is that data is a zero. And cultural privacy. Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, uh, so privacy, let's, let's well, we'll fork that, that off. Okay. So we'll, we'll, that's hugely critical, and I don't want to just touch upon it. But so here we'll, we'll, we will deal with just data about businesses, about places. Um, so that's not terribly private, sort of you know, where this office is located. You want people to know where this office is located. Retail establishments want to make sure their data is clean and well broadcasted across the internet uh, because it's good for them and it's good for the consumer. Everybody wins. But there's no model for non-zero sum data. So if I have data about places, um, I will very often be reluctant to, to exchange it or share it out unless there's a, a clear value that's articulated. And so uh, people still think of data as a, as a zero sum game, whereas if I give you data, then I've somehow lost value. When in truth, the factual's view is that data is more powerful, in most cases, not all, more powerful when it's shared. So if you think of the, the, the there's, think of, uh, I guess, the two examples I use for open data which are most valuable. One is technological and the other is natural. The technological one is GPS. So with GPS, that's the most successful open data play ever because by having those birds in the sky, we've now opened up the, uh, uh, the, the world's geographic data. And all sorts of businesses flourish on top of that open data set. The other one, of course, is on the natural side, is, uh, is a seed, right? So if I have a seed and I'm, I have an apple orchard, uh, apples create seeds or I can cut a bit off and splice it and give it to you, you can grow your own orchard. Now we are both better off because we both have orchards, we have cross-pollination. It's not that I'm chopping down my tree and then giving you an apple. And so I use those metaphors because they sort of articulate opposite extremes of where we are now, which is fundamentally people are thinking, well, I'm told with the big data movement that data has, all data has value. I don't know what that value is yet, and so I'm going to just lock it down. And Fally's proposi Factual's proposition is that when you share data, it's more powerful. So, for example, I have a business about a place. Um, I give it to you. Let's say I give you one million bits of data records about places. You correct bits on every one. If you share those cor uh, edits, corrections back with us, we both share ownership of that data. So you've helped us 
uh, we've helped you, and we shake hands and walk away happy. So, you know, the, in, in any ecosystem, you mentioned this is an enablement model, because essentially what you're saying is this is an enablement opportunity for folks, non-zero sum game, as you mentioned. Um, there's a phases of innovation. There's, you know, build, grow, value, or monetize. Build, grow, monetize. Uh, we're kind of in that build, mo build mode now. People are looking at holistically at data. Can you share your thoughts on, on where people are at right now based on, on, on your experience with the company talking to big platforms that have data? And as, yeah. as people who don't have the big platforms, they might be a small business sharing their address, kind of like a Yellow Pages model on the web, that want to take advantage of what the big guys have in platforms. So, so how do they build and how do they grow yeah. using data? Yeah, you know, I think there was a, with um, sort of the advent of big data, and let's say sort of three years ago, it was just a finger in the air sort of chalk mark about what I'm talking. The whole idea was that there are now new tools that I can use to better understand my content. How do I get those tools in? How do I find the expertise to work with the tools? And I, I think those kinds of questions on the, on the operational side have now become a little bit more refined. So I may, I may not need that. I can, I can now use a service. You know, Microsoft is pushing the ML as a service now, of course. Um, so uh, it's, it's no longer necessary of a question of, I have to have all these assets. It's, it's become much more subtle. And that subtlety is really reflected in, well, uh, I may not to need, need to work with, with big data myself, but I can identify someone who can process it for me and make it usable. So that's something factual does, certainly. Or I can hire in a service that allows me sort of on tap computational resources that I require. And so what you're seeing is a, a maturing of the industry where it's no longer a question of sort of a panic, knee jerk, I need to have all this. And it's much more of understanding but where the, what are the data assets, what are the raw material, what are the computational resources, and then the head count that I need to deliver. Uh, but in the overall spectrum of things, it's sort of, we're still in January on the calendar year of big data. So you think it's it's clearly build, build mode right now. People are in build out mode, not so much growth focus. So maybe some of the big boys maybe, but. Yeah, you know, um, I, I, it's certainly not growth phase because that implies that you've actually sort of locked it in and you know exactly what you're doing. Uh, I think it's still so early that we're still learning the potential. Whenever just like whenever any new technology is brought on board, the first question people ask is, can it do what I can do already? And then once that you can tick that box, people begin to say, oh, look, look at all these new ways that I can do things, where I actually now have a, the, the technical vocabulary to expand my product in ways that were just not possible before. And so I think we're right on that cusp where people are ticking the box and saying, okay, what can I do now that's new? Tyler, you're a vice president of the product team and, and knowing how product teams work, you have to balance kind of two roles. You got to look inward to the company and know the assets and, and the mojo that you have from a technology and staff standpoint and then out to the customer uh, facing market uh, on the go to market side and balancing that roadmap, what to deliver that I basically call the MVP, minimum viable product. So I got to ask you, how do you balance the roadmap um, from what you can deliver today and what the market's ready for. And specifically, you know, getting in there and getting your uh, success beachhead, if you will, for factual. Yeah. And then what do you sequence downstream? So some people call it headroom or, or whatnot. So, you know, you guys have a unique, very valuable product. What is, what is your focus there? I mean, how do you look at that and what are you doing specifically today mm. in market? Yeah, you know, um, I'm, I'm glad you asked me this question. That sounds so trite, but I'm glad you <laughs> asked because it's one of the most difficult things that we work with because what we found is we're not a company that starts out with a marketing message and then sort of looks down. Uh, we start out with the data and we say, look, we have all these fantastic resources. We have an expertise in location and, and data computation. And, and there are some very clear pain points and market needs. So we come up from the data side rather than down with, with a message. And I think that's very powerful because our data is the best that's out there, certainly. So the product is sound. But what's more important is that, uh, or I guess what's most revealing is that the difficulty that Factual has is, is taking all these you know, data wonks, as, as, as you noted, taking our, our products and basically understanding that they need to be reinterpreted for people in, in entirely different sectors. So how do we take this valuable packet of data about a place or about a person or someone's movements over time, and how do we articulate that value, not as raw JSON, but actually as a marketing message 
footage to say these are the wonderful use cases you can do. So, uh, I mean, I guess as an exemplar, it was only until uh, probably about a year, a year and a half ago that we had any kind of maps on our site. So we deal with location data, <laughs> but it's all articulated as, as just chunks of code, basically. And now we're beginning to say, look, this, this really requires, and we can do some really cool visualizations with the material that we have. So to, to your question, the big balance that I have there is, is um, in working with my team on the outbound side to ensure that we can articulate a coherent message but also always articulate the strength of the data. We never want to compromise what we have. We want to say, look, we have confidence metrics and percentile metrics that we give you when you consume our data, rather than what other folks say, that would, which is, yes, this person's a golfer, or no, this person's a golfer. <laughs> we can say, yeah, we're pretty sure this person's a golfer, and we're being open and transparent with, with, with you, or at least as far as the data allows us to be. It's always a challenge, you know, data is, the beauty of data is in the eye of the beholder, and, and it's really challenging for a company of your excellence to kind to have that approach because you can have make data for every diverse use case on the planet and be in 10 zillion markets. Um, so the broader market opportunity really is the scale point for you as a company. When do you see that straight and narrow on the broader market opportunity? So, so that's, the, that's the next question I want to ask you to kind of end the segment is, if you look at the data strategy holistically and say, okay, we see that data will be a big market. Uh, we know that that's growing, we see, we see evidence of that. Um, but now we have a consumerization trend that's really driving the data equation. It's not just about the product, product places yeah. and places and whatnot. It's about the audience themselves, the, the consumers who actually want value. And so, so now you have a consumer angle. Um, and you have some people who have been consumer facing, hey, I want to know all about the consumer, psychographic, demographics, all kinds of data there. I have all this data on the products that are out there. How do you, how do you integrate those two concepts? Yeah. Um, you've touched upon a very important point, and, and it, I, I said I'd, I'd break that up into two answers. The first is, by starting with the observation, is that Twitter's really uh, the first mechanism where the consumer has been allowed to talk back to the product or talk back to the brand. And that's just a sea change of, of, of how um, consumers engage with products and brands and places, stores, et cetera. Um, and I think that, uh, that it's because we no longer have a simple one-way communication, it's become two-way, it's become a conversation. Uh, what, you're, what you're seeing is twofold. One is on the technical side, uh, data is being used to better understand the consumers through the products that they engage with in, in the same way that you know, we want to better understand the places by the people that engage with them. And so you, you're, you're seeing now the raw materials for a very virtuous circle that's moving uh, us away from this shotgun approach where it's sort of one-to-many messaging, and that's what advertising is. Performs very poorly, in your face, rarely relevant, to the marketing message, which is one much more one-to-one, one -one, where we're actually engaging with each other now. And brands and advertisers are learning about that, but we now have the data that begins, yeah. uh, allows us yeah. to enable that. And you know, obviously, data is. You know, I'm a, I, we are data geeks, and I'm a data geek, and I self-confessed. But you know, essentially, what you're referring to is these, these new protocols are being developed. I mean, essentially, conversation is a handshake. If I have a conversation with you and you don't respond, you're not handshaking with me. You're not connecting. Uh, that's measurable. That's yes. unique. That's yeah. a unique data uh, data opportunity. So I got to ask you about the the personalization and the targeting and. You're seeing a lot of folks go for the ad serving market as ad tech is the first yeah. kind of obvious low hanging fruit, but what's beyond ad tech in terms of data? When you talk about the consumers connecting with brands, when you have real time, and which essentially location data is about real time, it's where people, what people do, where they are, um, how does that change the game in terms, yeah. of, in terms of the data opportunity for you guys and for your customers? Yeah. Locations uh, has two sides to it. One's the real-time thing. You know, where's the user now? And that's a hugely strong signal. Uh, but there's also the contextual side. Where have they been? Where do they go to over time? Because that's a great signal about what, what's important to this individual. Um, uh, to my earlier point about people picking up uh, a new technology and saying, can I do with it what I already do? Um, they're now picking up information about the user and saying, can I monetize that? And so can I take this new data that Factual provides and put this into an extant advertising model? And I see a bump, and that's, that's a good thing. 
But uh, where the future really is, is the idea of personalization. And so the reason that your phone behaves much like mine and others in this room is that uh, the phone, the device, the applications know so little about who you are as an individual. And there's all kinds of reasons for that. The, the siloed nature of mobile apps, uh, the whole idea of uh, Google and Apple interdicting the consumer almost in their entirety. So there's all sorts of reason why the device knows so little about who I am as, as a person. Uh, and because it doesn't have the data about me, it can't anticipate my needs. It can't articulate and surface things to me that are interesting. And I think most importantly, it can't filter all the crap that happens around us on a day-to-day -day level and really surface only the things that are interesting. And so what we're seeing now, I think, and what I would uh, I am keen to ensure that factual plays a part thereof, is that uh, data about individuals must be handled in a hugely uh, private and anonymous way, ideally, but nonetheless contain information that allows applications and devices to better engage with us as consumers and anticipate our needs. And that's, the, that's really the future. So my final question is kind of just to sum up, um, sum up the segment about factual and the data opportunity is, if someone comes to you and then a total stranger or a friend who's not in the business and says, Tyler, tell me about this, this, this experience, all this data is out there about me and my phone, where I go, real time, I'm in the crowd, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Facebook, I'm on my databases, I'm at work, this consumerization trend that's blending business in IT and, and the consumer apps. What is the most important thing that you would tell that person about what's really happening here? What is the value message that you would share with that person? Yeah, um, I would say that uh, we are now in the middle of a massive shift where consumers actually begin to understand and control their own data. Now, that may be directly as a so-called personal data locker. There's various reasons I don't think it's necessarily going to come to fruition in that form, but also indirectly in that I can understand which brands to engage with and what kind of data I can share off my device about me. And the reason that that's so critical is that uh, consumers are increasingly understanding that their, the data they, they contain and release about themselves has tangible value. You can go out and you can buy a database that has just a, a like phone identifier and, and then gender. And that sells for a big chunk of money. And the data is absolutely rubbish. But it gives you an indication that in aggregate information, that it, it gives you an, first an, a, a clear message that developers just don't know who the user is. They don't even know their gender. And you can't ask because people are like, hey, why are you asking me? So what you're seeing now is an artifact of that sort of uh, users understanding the data that they, they emit and control and its value is that product managers are changing their mindset and they're saying, look, if, if we want to know a user's gender or if we want to know a user's location, uh, we have to Give, give them something that actually merits our, our maintenance of that valuable data point. And so, for example, if you're a song app and you basically release music to your consumers, either on demand or by broadcast, what you can do is you can say, well, I want to get location in because it helps me really understand who that consumer is. But uh, you know, I'll tell the consumer, look, you don't have to do this. It's totally under your control. But if you do, uh, because we know all the cool bands that you like and your preferences, we'll tell you when they're in town and we'll give you special, de special deals. So it's, it's a, a question of incentives, but I think more importantly, it's gonna be a question of new experiences. What data, uh, when I release data as a consumer, what unparalleled novel experiences can I have that, that may, make my life easier? So there has to be a transactional exchange of some sort. So for the opportunity on the other side of the coin for the business is what then? To exchange value, insight? Uh, indeed, yeah. So, so the, the, uh, the, the business, the publisher, uh, produces a better experience. It's much more engaging. And I think that value right there is absolutely fantastic. Like if, if I have an app which is much more anticipatory, if it, if it even the most basic one of routing, for example, if this app can save me 10 minutes on my way into work, then that's a very good value that's exchanged. But that's a pretty facile example. We're Tyler Bell, Vice President of Product at Factual, making tools and automation and technology, making data uh, make sense. Uh, thanks for joining uh, us here on the Cube Conversations. Uh, thanks for watching.